annual action auction. Call 615-259-9325. WDCN Nashville. This week on Sneak Previews, the latest Star Trek explodes on the screen with two Enterprise captains for the price of one. And The Professional, a violent love story about a hitman and a little girl. And Interview with a Vampire with 200 years of undead adventures starring Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. Plus The Santa Claus and Two Miracles on 34th Street, all on this week's Sneak Previews. Captain of the Enterprise. That's right. Close to retirement? I'm not planning on it. Let me tell you something. Don't. Don't let them promote you. Don't let them transfer you. Don't let them do anything that takes you off the bridge of that ship because while you're there, you can make a difference. Come back with me. Help me stop Sauron. Make a difference again. Who am I to argue with the captain of the Enterprise? What's the name of that planet? Viridian 3? Yes. I take it the odds are against us and the situation is grim. You could say that. You know, if Spock were here, he'd say that I was an irrational, illogical human being for taking on a mission like that. Sounds like fun. Well, we'll see if it sounds like fun to us when we review Star Trek Generations, the latest offering in a very profitable series where two great captains of the Enterprise manage to work together even though they live a hundred years apart. Now, this ambitious, lavish, and very complicated film is just one of six titles we cover on this week's show. I'm Michael Medved. And I'm Jeffrey Lyons, and we'll go boldly where six movies have gone before in just a minute. But first up is The Professional. It's from cult director Luc Bresson, best known for his hit film La Femme Nikita. Gary Oldman plays a corrupt DEA agent. Now he's about to lead a murderous attack on a small time drug dealer and his innocent family in their tiny New York apartment. I like these calm little moments before the storm. It reminds me of Beethoven. Now, the only survivor of the carnage is the drug dealer's daughter, played by a stunning 13-year-old newcomer named Natalie Portman, who finds safety in the next-door apartment, then learns that the man who lives there and who becomes her protector, Jean Reno, doesn't exactly sell encyclopedias door-to-door. Don't touch that, please. Leanne, what exactly do you do for a living? Cleaner. You mean you're a hitman? Yeah. Cool. This is one of those films that has an artsy, polished surface and terrific camera work. Luc Bresson always does his own camera work and it shows here, but there's no substance to it at all. I mean, we're supposed to care deeply about the Jean Reno character, but the only thing they have for characterization is they show that he loves his potted plant and carries it with him everywhere, and he loves to drink milk and does sit-ups all alone in bed in the morning, and that's supposed to give us a lot of sympathy for the character and help us understand him. It doesn't work. I think I disliked it even more than you did. It's a needless bloodbath saved only by the performance of Danny Aiello in the end who 
can help any movie, even one like this. But this is a kind of formulaic movie in a strange way. The way they do in the Clint Eastwood movies as well, in the early part of the Dirty Harry movies and here, they do something to show you that this guy is who he is. In the first part of the movie, he takes out 10 or 11 thugs all by himself, and we're expecting this almost supernatural creature. Then they spend the rest of the movie trying to show you that he really has a heart of gold. But I, mean, I don't need no, that. No, but you know, the supernatural creature, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, this is as ridiculous as an old Errol Flynn swashbuckler where he kills 100 people <laughs> when he's fighting them all alone, and yet it's done in such a realistic, graphically gory way. It makes the gore even more gratuitous because clearly this is utterly implausible the entire plot point about him battling all these thousands of people so successfully makes no sense so you feel the violence is even more offensive implausible what the world needs now is not movies in which a man shows a 13 year old girl how to become a contract killer and showing drug enforcement agencies who are pretty brave people popping pills the way Gary Oldman does in committing murder and he overacts throughout the movie every second he's on <laughs> I, he overacts. I must say I found his boy, overacting oh fascinating and I thought Natalie Portman was pretty good but look there's a very big problem here isn't it peculiar that two movies that were doing the same week uh, interview with a vampire later in the show and this one both are about little girls having uh, r romantic mm -hmm. involvements with much older guys here she actually tries to seduce him at one point it's really difficult to watch and with all the problems we have with child molesting you know you wonder about how responsible not to give is. anything away we'll call it movies we don't need well <laughs> next up is the Santa Claus a comedy starring Tim Allen whom you see every week on TV's home improvement now here he plays a divorced father whose son is spending Christmas Eve with him when, to their surprise, in the middle of the night, they hear some suspicious noises on their roof. Hey you! What's up? Oh, oh, oh. Stay where you are. Charlie, would you listen to me? Stay up there. He's Santa. You killed him. Uh, I don't know, Scott. You're, you're as healthy as a horse. Yeah. Clydesdale. The chance encounter with Santa leads to some drastic changes, which, like it or not, he's got a stomach. Does this look like a little weight to you? Weight can fluctuate from year to year. Fluctuate? You make it sound like I'm retaining water. I've gained 45 pounds in a week. Pete, what's happening to me? Well, what's your diet like? Milk and cookies. Really? But I don't finish all the milk. Well, then there is your problem. Just try to cut back on the sweets, okay? <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. How fast does hair grow? Facial hair. What? I shave in the morning and in the afternoon. I look like this. Well, it could be a hormonal imbalance. That would explain the mood swings. Mood swings? Yeah, but look at my hair. It's turning gray. Oh, it's middle age, buddy. It happens. And with that body, you should be thankful you have hair. Yeah, and I'm thankful that I do, too. But, you know, the <laughs> fact is, I've got to say, I really wanted to like this movie. Tim Allen is a thoroughly likable, thoroughly funny performer. But this movie just remains so earthbound. The sleigh never gets off the ground. And part of the problem is when you're dealing with one of the most magical legends in the world and about half the movie shows sleighs flying over the earth and magical reindeer and Santa's workshop in the North Pole, all of that looked so chintzy and so bland, and you'd have this one premise, which isn't even really that funny. It doesn't really even make that much sense. It's stretched out and stretched out and stretched out. I think the movie's a bit of a bore, and for me, falls flat. Okay, let's get the record straight. First you said the sleigh didn't come off the ground. Then you said it goes up. There are scenes of Santa flying. They try to make it go up, but it's unconvincing. Enough. They use a few good special effects, but they, keep, they use them very judiciously when he goes through the chimney and when a fireplace suddenly appears. But the movie hinges on Tim Allen, who's a TV star who's making a wonderful starring debut, he has an empathy and an earthiness and a communication ability with the audience that is magical. You feel for the guy, you understand what he's going through. There are good supporting performances by Peter Boyle, a sense of the holidays and a sense of goodness and happiness. That's all the movie.
movie's trying I think to do. You're, I think you're overstating it. If you want a sense of goodness or happiness, the other Santa Claus movie that's out there that we're dealing with later, Miracle of Thir on 34th oh, Street, delivers better. that. Right. It's much better. Right. And the problem with this one is, sure, Tim Allen is likable, but the whole idea that somebody has Santa Claus fall off a roof and then he slowly becomes Santa Claus is just goes on forever. And, and the difficulty is you never cut very deep emotionally, even though they do throw a little few scenes in with showing the divorced father sort of uh, referencing Miss, Mrs. Doubtfire, who's just yearning to spend more time with his son. None of that is convincing at all. Michael, and that combined with the chintzy special effects, I think is going to make people feel a little bit cheated when they go in to see this allegedly feel-good movie. We're not the intended audience. The intended audience is very young here, kids who may not be able to stay up every night to see Tim Allen and Home Improvement. <laughs> we are not the intended audience. I think the intended audience, very young viewers, will love this. And, and you know what? what and you know what? Do. I think for very, very young viewers, I mean, three, four, five-year-olds, it might even be a little bit scary having Santa Claus die. I'm not sure that's ah, such a they great love idea. It. Listen to some of their nursery well, rhymes. Next up is Star Trek Generations, a completely different movie. This one marks the first big screen appearance for the cast of characters from the popular TV series Star Trek: The Next Generation. And for Captain Jean-Luc Picard, played by Patrick Stewart, of course. It's just a normal day on the bridge, saving the universe from extinction. Report. A quantum implosion has occurred within the Amagosa star. All nuclear fusion is breaking down. How is that possible? Sensor records show the observatory launched a solar probe into the sun a few moments ago. The star is going to collapse in a matter of minutes. Sir, the implosion has produced a level 12 shockwave. That'll destroy everything in this system. Transporter room to bridge. I can't locate Commander LaForge or Mr. Data, sir. Did they come back to the ship? No, sir. They are not on board. How long before the shockwave hits the observatory? Four minutes, 40 seconds. Number one. Mr. Wharf? Aye, sir. Every Star Trek movie has a brilliant, vengeful maniac of a bad guy. And this time it's Malcolm McDowell, a scientist so mean that he can't even get along with his Klingon allies. Wait. I hope for your sake you are initiating a mating ritual. You got careless. The Romulans came looking for their missing trilithium. Impossible. We let no survivors on their outpost. They knew it was on the observatory. If the Enterprise hadn't intervened, they would have found it. They didn't find it. And now we have a weapon of unlimited power. No, Lursa. I have the weapon. And if you ever want me to give it to you, I would advise you to be a little more careful in the future. Perhaps we are tired of waiting. <laughs> Without my research, the trilithium is worthless. As are your plans to reconquer the Klingon Empire. Malcolm McDowell's schemes lead to a frightening time warp phenomenon that only the Enterprise can stop. It should be noted, sir that the collapse of the Viridian star would produce a shockwave similar to the one we observed at Amagosa. Destroying all the planets in this system. Viridian 3 is uninhabited. However, Viridian 4 supports a pre-industrial humanoid society. Population? 230 million, sir. We got the great more here, sir. Is it a course for the Viridian system? Maximum warp. Jim, I'm only a doctor. I can't pilot this ship. I, I know. I just <laughs> expecting to hear the Forrest Kelly, who is not in I this missed movie. Him. Neither is Spock. You know. I missed him. This is another one of the movies in which they stare at a lot of screens, and every <laughs> 20 minutes or so, they're all tumbled about the starship. And when they hit something, or something hits them, and a, a plot, you could have sat in front of the TV set the last five years and taken notes on every one of the Star Trek uh, episodes, the new ones, and you still would be confused. It is the most complex, that's unnecessary because, that's because movie. because all of the new plots on TV are oh, better than this one. God. This is a bomb. This, as far as I'm concerned, turns Star Trek into Star Drek. It is an embarrassing motion picture. I mean, you talk about them being hurtled about the cabin. You know, they, they are so often thrown off their chairs exactly. and bounced against the well, walls. So when, when, when I wonder, why do? don't they wear seatbelts, you know? <laughs> Even a Hyundai 
guy today <laughs> has a shoulder harness. Why not in an intergalactic cruiser traveling at warp speed? When they don't know what to do, they just say, well, let's shake up the cool a little bit. And then you don't know, at the end, the final scene has a fight between Patrick Stewart and Malcolm McDowell and also William uh, Shatner. William Shatner a and fist fight. three of them, all three of them. And I mean, that's an interesting part in that they don't use many special effects. And so, I, I mean, I don't even want to describe it. It's so complex and but, hard to understand. But too. you see, he talks of maximum warp. This thing needed some warp speed because it has long stretches of absolutely nothing happening. It is just painful. They stand there almost rigidly on the bridge, delivering lines that don't make any sense. And the fact is, look, they needed the ultimate cute meat to bring uh, Jean-Luc Picard and, and uh, James Tiberius right. Kirk together because they live a century apart. But the way they've constructed the plot, it is so completely nonsensical. And what is Whoopi Goldberg doing in the movie? She uncredited. shows up. Yeah, uncredited, uncredited, which wisely, is interesting. Wisely. And she shows up and, tri and, and her part tries to bring all the plots together. Even the presence of this great actress doesn't help. You know, I'm, I must say, this is the worst of the series. Up till now, I'd always thought that Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, the one that was directed by Shatner, was the right. run to the litter. This now takes the cake. It's the worst Star Trek ever. I really hope they don't make money on it. Please. I like the one where they go to San Francisco. This one is the totally one about saving the whales. Yeah, right. that was the best. Now, next up is Interview with a Vampire. Now, this is already the most popular film in the country at the moment. And what it begins when a cynical interviewer, who's played by Christian Slater, asks some questions of a mysterious stranger played by Brad Pitt and asked him to talk about his life. So, what do you do? I'm a vampire. <laughs> That's something I haven't heard before. You, uh, you mean this literally, I take it? Absolutely. I was waiting for you in that alleyway. Watching you, watching me. And then you began to speak. So what a lucky break for me. Perhaps lucky for both of us. You uh, said you were waiting for me. What were, what were you going to do? Kill me, drink my blood, all that stuff? Yes. But you needn't be concerned with that now. You really believe this, don't you, that you're a vampire? We can't begin this way. Let me turn on the light. I thought vampires didn't like the light. We love it. I only wanted to prepare you. Don't be frightened. As Brad Pitt tells his story, the movie flashes back 200 years to a time when the main character and his vampire mentor, played by Tom Cruise, drain the blood from a little girl and then adopt her into their dysfunctional bloodsucker family. A little child she was, but also a fierce killer, now capable of the ruthless pursuit of blood with all a child's demanding. can't do accents. You know, this movie almost turned me into a vegetarian. <laughs> Watching this picture, I kept saying, get this yuppie twaddle off the screen. There are occasionally some interesting moments and performances, but it is stomach-churningly gory and explicit and tedious and pretentious more than anything well, else. Well, it is all of that. Oh, you say there's some God. interesting performances. The real problem with the movie for me is Tom Cruise. Not that he's too bad. He's too good. Yeah, he's, he's outstanding. Playing on another level. He and, certainly and, is. And when he goes off the screen, which is about halfway through the movie, he disappears from the plot, the movie loses all of its bite. The blood drains so from it, so to speak. And, and then Antonio Banderas sort of takes over, well, who is awful in the I film. speak Spanish, and I couldn't understand a word of his English at all, <laughs> given the accent, given everything. Why use him if his English is learned phonetically in a role which you really have to understand what he's doing there? And then Stephen Ray is in, because it's directed by Neil Jordan, who made The Crying Game, which made yeah. Stephen Ray a star. You can hardly recognize Stephen Ray, and I couldn't understand much of what his character was well, doing either. Well, this is actually much more similar to oh. another uh, a Neil Jordan film that he did earlier in his career, Company of Wolves, mm -hmm. which is also very gory and atmospheric. I think he uses the lo New Orleans locations very well, but the Paris locations fall very flat. The whole problem with the movie is the second half just collapses, it doesn't work, and you feel as if you've been through 200 years with these characters and not pleasant company Absolutely, most of the time. Absolutely, totally unnecessary. Well, in our Family Find section of the show, there's not a vampire movie. No, this week we're happy to recommend 
two different versions of the same classic tale, and that, of course, is Miracle on 34th Street. Now, one of those versions, which we also covered last week, is the big new John Hughes remake, starring Richard Attenborough as the department store Santa, who thinks he's the real thing. And here, he sits down with little Mara Wilson, who you might remember from Mrs. Doubtfire, playing the skeptical daughter of an even more skeptical single mom. There really has to be something you want for Christmas. I'm very good at keeping secrets, you know. Oh, what's this? Santa Claus, you can get it for me. If you can't, you're just a nice man with a white beard like my mother says. Why don't you give me a chance? The 1947 original version, available everywhere on video, features exactly the same scene, this time with eight-year-old Natalie Wood as the little girl, and Edmund Gwen as Kris Kringle, the role that won him an Oscar that year for Best Supporting Actor. what I want for Christmas. You mean a doll's house like this? No, a real house. If you're really Santa Claus, you can get it for me. And if you can't, you're only a nice man with a white beard like Mother said. Now, wait a minute, Susie. Just because every child can't get his wish, that doesn't mean there isn't a Santa Claus. That's what I thought you'd say. No, but don't you see, dear? Some children wish for things they couldn't possibly use, like real locomotives or B-29s. But this is like a locomotive or a B-29. It's awful big for a little girl like you. What could you possibly do with a house like this? Live in it with my mother. But you've got this lovely apartment. I don't think it's lovely. I want a backyard with a great big tree to put a swing on and... I guess you can't get it, huh? Oh, I didn't say that. It's a tall order, but I'll do my best. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Mr. Kringle. Well, both little girls dream of moving out of New York, which is the only aspect of the movies I didn't like. But that aside, they're, they're both smart. They're oh, come on, they're delightful in different ways. The old one, of course, you could think of the career that lay ahead of Natalie Wood. Also, some of the references like B-29s, and it has its own place in, in, in time. And I can understand why they made the remake, because this gets a theatrical audience, it's in color for younger audiences. Well, well not only that, it is a different film. And you can see the difference right in the comparison of those two scenes. In the uh, Natalie Wood version, the original version, you don't see the father and the brother in mm -hmm. the little uh, uh, picture that she shows him. It's much more explicit in the new one, the sort of yearning for completion, the yearning for an intact family, and also the yearning for a deeper faith, a faith that the world makes sense, which I think is much more typical of our cynical age than the more innocent age in which the original was made. And that's why I think that the new version has an even deeper emotional resonance. I think Richard Attenborough, or Sir Richard Attenborough, if you will, was just as good as, as uh, Edmund Gwynn in the original, but I did like Maureen O'Hara, the original mother, better than Elizabeth Perkins this well, time. You, Those comparisons are inevitable. Well, of course, they are. but the reason that I liked Elizabeth Perkins is because, yeah, there's a sour edge to her performance, but it's appropriate. I mean, she's showing you she's a single mother, she's a harried executive, she's having a difficult time. Both Natalie Wood and Maureen O'Hara are, are so chirpy, or so upbeat the whole time in the first film. I think it makes sort of the transformation that's brought about in their lives by the romance and by Kris Kringle a little bit less effective. But I can't watch the original without realizing that I grew up on that block where the <laughs> May 6th Thanksgiving Day Parade is. I was three years old, you do the math, and I kind of think where was I when they were shooting Look, that? that? People goes can't me. go wrong with either one. They should go see the new movie and then go home and rent the original for but comparison. But don't dream of leaving New York. Summarizing our opinions on the movies we reviewed this week. There's no best bet, no new movie we both enthusiastically recommend. 
We both disliked The Professional, however, a hopelessly implausible bloodbath, though I did like Danny Aiello in a supporting role, and Michael admired the hypnotic style of director Luc Bresson, though it's all wasted on a senseless plot. There's a stream of foul language, some strong sexual references, and since it's about a professional killer, naturally lots of horrific violence. We disagreed on the Santa Claus. I thought Tim Allen's delightful screen persona raised an ordinary screenplay to the level of good family fun. But Michael thought this whole Santa slid off the roof and fell flat painfully extending a weak premise. There's no foul language, of course, sex nor violence here, but a scene of a dead Santa in the snow may trouble very young viewers. But we agreed on Star Trek Generations. This was a tedious voyage with a plot that even devoted Trekkies won't be able to follow. The state-of-the-art special effects are quickly canceled out by long stretches of sheer boredom. There are lots of violent encounters, though most are done in the benign science fiction vein, except for the final fight among three uh, aging actors, which is unintentionally hilarious. And we both were disappointed in Interview with a Vampire. I detested its pretentiousness and its explicit gore. While Michael admired the surprisingly strong performance by Tom Cruise, he felt that the movie lost its bite when Cruz's character leaves the screen halfway through. There's some off-color language, graphic, often revolting sexual content, and no surprise, an astonishing amount of bloody, stomach-churning violence. So spend your time instead with our family finds. Either the remake or the original version on video of Miracle on 34th Street, which will warm every heart, young and old, and rekindle your belief in Kris Kringle and all that's good about life. So that's it for this week's show. Please join us next time when we review Junior. That's the new comedy with Danny DeVito, Emma Thompson, and a pregnant Arnold Schwarzenegger. And The Page Master with Macaulay Culkin and Christopher Lloyd in an adventure that mixes live action and animation. And Heavenly Creatures, a true story about an intense friendship that leads to a shocking murder. All on the next Sneak Previews. I'm Michael Medved. And I'm Jeffrey Lyons. And until next time on Sneak Previews, don't forget to save us the aisle seats.